Uh, I'm now I'm here to talk about password security. So this is going to be a real grown-up talk. Um, we're going to talk about something that um, a lot of you guys use every day. And um, I thought um, in this talk, we are going to build a password system from the ground up. So that means that uh, anyone can follow along because uh, we're going to start very simple. But uh, first, a bit about me. So my name is Mil Bay. Um, my day work is uh, working on a small startup called Commodity Trader. I'm the technical founder. And uh, Commodity Trader is a uh, stock exchange for grain. So that means you can buy grain online. So you can uh, you can talk to me and uh, I can give you like a full boat of grain. And a full boat of grain is like 500 tons of grain. So you can bake like heaps of bread for all your friends. Um, if that's of interest to you, you can come talk to me afterwards. Um, you can also find me online, like on GitHub and Twitter and um, yeah, LinkedIn or whatever under Emil Base. I'm from uh, Copenhagen, Denmark, by the way. Um, but um, running a startup is really hard, so I also do uh, consulting. That's when I'm this guy. So do security consulting and uh, Node.js and that kind of stuff. So uh, I used to study math, and password security has a lot of cryptography in there. But uh, if any of you are scared of math, you don't have to worry. We're not going to talk about mathematics today. It's all going to be really easy to follow along. So. Um, OK, passwords, that's what we're here for. So um, why do we have passwords? Just to get everyone on the same page. Uh, passwords, you use them to prove your identity. So if you go to um, go and buy a pass, you want to get a passport or whatever, you have to prove your identity somehow. And you usually show your birth certificate, and they can see that your face kind of matches what they think. And um, like you have some way of proving your identity. On the internet, it's a bit harder. You can't really carry your passport around with you. and um, yeah, so when the internet started out, people kind of, kind of converged on uh, maybe you can just like remember something that only you know, and because people can read your mind, at least not yet, then uh, you, if you if you know the password, you should be the pe the person you um, say you are. So that's why we ended up with like uh, the current model where you put in a username, th which is public, and then you have your password, which is something you never share with anyone. Um, and passwords are so ubiquitous now that anyone, like everyone has a password. It's so ingrained into society that like, even my grandmom has a password now, or maybe she has multiple passwords. Um, so it is something that we need, really need to protect. The problem, though, is that um, most people only have one password. So if that one password is leaked, then suddenly your whole online identity is broken because um, this is what happens. People. S steal your password, and uh, maybe they steal it from something that's not uh, very sensitive, like, I don't know, the booking system with your hairdress or something like that. But if you only have one password and you use the same password for your internet banking, then suddenly you're bust. So what can we do about this? I think there's three things we can do. We can remove and eradicate all security holes in all software, which is uh, very ambitious and a very noble goal, but I don't think it's going to be achieved in any foreseeable future. Um, another thing we can do is to have unique passwords everywhere, so never reuse our passwords. That means if it gets stolen from a hairdresser, it doesn't mean that they um, adversary. Adversary is like a fancy word for saying hacker in uh, crypto terms. The adversary can't go and steal all my money in my online banking. Or we can have safer storage of the passwords. So safer storage of the passwords. That's what we had to talk about today. Um, though I increasingly think that the only solution is to have unique passwords everywhere. Because if you, um, so in cryptography, you always talk about threat modeling. Like what, what's, the, what's, gonna, like what's the worst thing that can happen, kind of. And um, in our case, you as a user, going to a website, you put all your trust in that website, being able to protect your credentials. Um, which is kind of a weird model because why should you why should you trust the developer that made the um, your hairdresser's booking system? I mean, so um, if you want to protect yourself, I think the only thing you can do is to have a uh, password safe and uh, have your master password there, and then use unique passwords for everywhere. The problem is though that that's not very um, maybe user friendly. I mean, my grandma she's probably not going to have a password safe anytime soon. So, what's the next best thing? it is to keep the passwords safe for our users. So here's a little riddle for you. What do all these companies have in common? Well, we're going to find out. Um, they were all visited by this guy. This is not the same guy as before. All Logo Lego people look alike, so uh, this is another guy. So um, OK, let's build a password system. Start from the beginning. 
Um, let's just take it in easy steps. The first thing we can do, and the most naive solution, is what's in uh, cryptography called uh, plain text. So storing the original password in a database. I know a lot of you are probably going to think that's pretty stupid. I mean, you can just skip this step. It's just so silly that nobody would do this. Um, but um, we're, gonna, we're just going to start here because it's simple and it's easy. Can you actually read this, or should I make it a bit larger? It's okay. It's okay. Okay, so um, so if you when you come home and you go through um, all the examples, they have this general structure. So uh, we have a like a, a database of some kind up here. In this case, I'm just um, I've just put in a, like a map there that we can store things in. It's just for for the examples. But um, the thing is, when you register, you take in people's username and you take the password and you save it to the database, right? Because then when they come back later, you can verify that they knew this unique thing like the password so that they can prove their identity. And then when you want to lock people in, it's very simple. Take the username, the password, and you get the username out of the database, and you look at the password, and you compare them, and you return true or false. So that's pretty simple. A lot of you guys have probably um, implemented this before. And then down the bottom here, I just have a, I call the register method, I put in my username, and then I choose the most common passwords of all the passwords, one password. Um, and then afterwards, we have uh, we try to log in first with the uh, the one password, and then we try dragon. Dragon is another of the like the most common passwords in all the password leaks. So um, if we just run this, I just uh, have it over here on the side. You can see that it uh, returns true and false because that's what I log out here. So this was just the most naive solution. So now we started. Um, so uh, if we put out the database, this is probably what it's going to look like. So we have uh, made this little service for my pets, and we have me in here, and I had chose a very bad password, which was a secret. Then we have my cat, and cats are very suspicious and very smart, so it, took the, it chose a really good pa password, which is, which is uh, all hail the laser pointer. And uh, then we have my dog and my second dog, and, and the problem is that dogs, they just want belly rubs all day. They don't have too much attention span, so they both chose some really bad password, which is just scroll. Um, the other thing is that uh, these two guys, though my two dogs, they actually chose the same password. I mean, you can't really stop people from using the same passwords, that's all right, but uh, we're going to see later that that's kind of a problem. So it's very obvious that um, it's a big problem that we have it in plain text because uh, what if uh, a system administrator at your company or one of your developers, uh, you kind of can't agree on things and then he wants to get, he gets vengeful, and then what he does is that he steals your password database and he leaks it on the internet, and then suddenly your whole company is losing their face. Um, it's a big problem. And it's also very stupid, right? This seems really silly. Nobody would do this. Anyone knows that you can't store this kind of stuff in uh, plain text. Well, not everyone. Because these guys didn't know that you couldn't do this. Oh, well, maybe they didn't have time to implement the right way, but I mean, it just seems so outlandish that anyone in like, 2015 would p put plain text passwords in a database. So, um, yeah. Okay, so the problem is that it's too easy to figure out what the password was, like if you want to steal people's passwords. So, one thing we can try, the next the next thing, like to get just a bit better, is we can try and obscure the passwords. So, by obscure, I mean that we turn it into something where it's very hard to see what the original password was, uh, even if you're a predetermined um, adversary. Um, I don't want to say encrypt. People have tried encrypting passwords, and uh, uh, one of those was Adobe. Has that's been a, like a very prolific uh, leak from um, one of Adobe's online services, and they tried encrypting passwords, and they kind of screwed up with the whole encryption part. So it's actually a lot easier to figure out what the password was. So stay away from encryption. Let's uh, let's do something else that uh, the cryptographic community has figured out, which is hashing. So you probably heard that you, when you talk about um, passwords in storage, you usually call them password hashes. And that's because you take the plain text password and you put it through something called a hash function. So why can we use hash functions? Well, because hash functions have a couple of properties. And, and specifically, we are going to look at cryptogra cryptographic hash functions. So one, hash function are deterministic. So determinism just means that the hash function uh, given an input given a specific input, will always give the same output. That seems um, kind of logical, right? You want it to always return the same value. You, want, you don't want it to be dependent on like the alignment of the planets or whatever. Um, then we have a couple of other properties that we're going to use in our case. One is what's called pre-image resistance. So when a hash function is pre-image resistant, it means it's one way. So it means if you get the output, you get the password hash, you go into the database, you read the password hash. 
it's going to be impossible or it should be impossible for you to determine what the original password was unless you try all possible passwords in the whole universe kind of thing. So that seems pretty nice. That means that uh, once we've obscured the password, we can every time someone comes to our service and tries to log in, we can just pull through a hash function. We compare what the hashes are. But if you have a rogue sysadmin or you have some um, bad employee, they can't go into the database and just figure out what the passwords were without using a lot of time and energy. Then we have another, a couple of uh, other properties uh, that I'll just quickly skip over. Basically, it means that um, the first one basically means that uh, you don't want two different passwords to give the same hash. You don't want people to be able to give you the wrong password, but by accident be able to log in. And the last one just means that you want the passwords to all give out unique hashes. Even if you change the password just a slight bit, it should give a radically unique hash. So. I um, said before that I studied math. This is a fancy way of, of saying the last slide. So I like wasted three years of my life to be able to do this show off. What it basically says is, so a hash function is like taking an infinite amount of bits. So this is infinite, this is bits, and turn them into a finite amount of bits, so n bits. And um, the ha all the different hash functions all have pretty much uh, different um, outputs, but it's usually uh, 256 bits or 512 bits. So here are a couple of hash functions. Um, some of them are good and some of them are bad. Um, you probably heard about some of them, uh, like MD5 and SHA-1. People still hash passwords with MD5 and SHA-1. Never, ever, ever do this. Um, uh, MD5, uh, MD5 was broken in uh, 1996, so I was born in 1993. MD5 was broken when I was wearing a diaper, and people in 2016 still hash passwords with MD5. I hope now it's 2017 that people have like learned their lesson and stopped doing that, but it is still around, so don't do that. Examples, the examples I'm going to show today, all use MD5, but now we like everyone here knows that MD5 shouldn't be used, right? So you can just abstract here from that when you see the examples. Another one is, is SHA-1. SHA-1 stands for Secure Hash Algorithm. So SHA-1 uh, is also broken now. It's broken um, last year by uh, Google. It's been suspected broken, and there's been something called reduction attacks for uh, pretty much since MD5 was broken. There's been attacks, but we have yet to have found a collision, and that's what happened last year if you heard about the shattered paper. SHA-1, by the way, is the hash function that's into, uh, built into Git. So when you do a Git commit and you get out the random value, that's a SHA-1 hash. Um, then you have a couple of other cryptographic hash functions. These are all designed to be very, very fast, very, very efficient, use very little memory and very little um, CPU cycles so that you can use them to do cryptographic fingerprinting or you can use them to um, hash your Git commits and be able to make, uh, make sure that you actually, like nobody tampered with the commit when you pull from GitHub. So um, SHA-1 has been the state of the art for, or like n not state of the art, but the the algorithm of choice for a lot of years. Now, uh, Black 2, which is uh, my favorite or my go-to hashing algorithm, it's much faster than MD5, but it's more secure than SHA-2. Uh, so that's why I put the race car there. If you need a hash function, you can use Black 2. Uh, and then we have SHA-3, which we, I won't talk about. Then we have these guys down here, the button, and these are actually password secure, like, um, cryptographically secure password hash functions. We have bcrypt, which I'll talk a bit about later. We have scrypt, which used to be the um, the go-to hash function. But uh, then we have argon2, and uh, it's not by coincidence that I put the strong arm there. We're going to talk a bit about argon2 later. So um, now I'm just going to show a quick example of um, how to use a hash function for, for doing your stuff. So it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, we have to import the crypto module node. I mean, if you're in any other programming language, uh, you probably have a similar, um, maybe a hash module or, or a crypto library or something you import. Here in node's case, we create the hash function and we use MD5, which is pretty bad, right? But it's just for the example. And then we put in the password and we get what's called digest. So the hash value out, that's what we put into the database. And then when we have to do a, uh, our login, we do the whole shabam again, and it's just, um, that's it. So um, we can try and run it again. I put in some new passwords down here at the bottom. These uh, passwords I put in here are some of the other most common passwords when you look at the uh, various password leaks out there. So um, just uh, run this. You can see it returns true and false as it's supposed to. So um, these are radically different words. So I mean, they should give different hash values, right, and all that. So it's um, it's uh, 
it's pretty obvious that the password wouldn't work. So uh, this is the digest of it. This is what what you do to uh, to do a, a hash in uh, in Node.js. And uh, this was our uh, database before, and this is our database now. So you can see that um, now we have these hash values, and it's impossible or should be impossible to go from this hash value back to the password. So in this case, the password was uh, turtle. And um, to be able to figure out what this value <laughs> originally was, you have to try out all the passwords, like all words that you can possibly imagine, or at least you should, to, um, to figure out that this maps to turtle. Um, we have one problem though. So my two dogs, they both chose the same password. The problem is that because the function is deterministic, we give it the same input. They both had the password scroll, they both get the hash scroll. That's kind of an issue because that means that if you go, if you have a leaked database and uh, you use a hash function, then uh, you can try and figure out what users had the same password. So you can try and sort all the passwords in the database and figure out what passwords appear the most and that's where you're gonna start your cracking. That's the password you wanna try cracking first. Um, so, and that also means that if you crack one password, then suddenly a lot of users are compromised and you can go and probably log into a lot of uh, internet banking accounts. So, in uh, fancy words, this is called rainbow tables. If you uh, try and figure out what passwords map to which value, in cryptography it's called a dictionary attack. And I'll just quickly show you, it's very, very easy to make a dictionary attack. Um, oh well, it's kind of easy. The hard part is this thing, figuring out what words do you want to try. So um, in a minute, I'm just going to show you an example. Uh, what I did was just read out the dictionary that's uh, built into my Mac. Then what we do is that we take all the words, we uh, use the same hash function as the application used, then we make, that's what's called a rainbow table, because you have on one side, you have, the, um, you have all the original words, on the other side, you have all the hash values, and then all you need to do is to go into your rainbow table, look up the hash from the database that you stole, and then that will give you the index of the word, and then you have suddenly the plain text. So sounds kind of complicated, right? It is kind of complicated in the real world, but you can go on the um, one of the black market websites and you can buy rainbow tables of like uh, 12 gigabyte compressed, and that's probably going to cost you something like five dollars. It's very very cheap. If you want to buy passwords, on the other hand, that's pretty cheap too. You can buy. I saw the latest um, stat, like the leak that was uh, a couple of weeks ago that appeared on uh, HaveBeenFound.com. I think it was uh, three billion credentials, and he paid eighty dollars for that. So you can buy uh, three million use, uh, three billion users for eighty dollars, and you can go away and try and log into people's internet banking accounts, and probably uh, recover that cost very quickly. So uh, let's try and run this. I'll just show what it actually looks like. Um, so here we have the dictionary attack um, thing down here at the bottom. So what I did was just um, take in the FS module read in all the uh, words in the dictionary. Um, so then new line delimiters just split them and map them and then we try and figure out what, uh, what was the original password. So in this, pa in this case, I've just chosen a, um, a, a word that was in the dictionary because then we can show the example and uh, you'll be surprised by how quickly this runs. So there we go. Crack my password in 1.3 seconds. So uh, dictionary attacks, um, yeah. Uh, but um, that doesn't mean that somebody out there didn't screw up. So these guys fucked up in um, 2015. Uh, both of these guys, um, so it's uh, last FM and LinkedIn. Both of these guys had, I think one of them used MD5 and the other one used SHA-1. The two algorithms with the red strokes over that both been broken since 1996. So that like 20 years to, uh, to recover this. I mean, these guys weren't even around when the hash functions were broken, so yeah. Um, so the problem, the problem was that they had these uh, identical passwords, so it's very, very easy. Well, the thing is, this rainbow table, you can just compute it up front, you can just go on Amazon, buy some huge servers for like two hours, pass through a lot of random strings, and then suddenly you just have a big as rainbow table and you can do offline attacks, so it's very, very easy to recover a lot of passwords very cheaply. Um, so the thing is, we want to increase the cost, we want to make it expensive to crack our passwords. So we want to make identical passwords, so scroll, we want to map it to unique hashes. So even if people use the same password, there's nothing there for an attacker to um, steal without actually having to crack every single password. So this is called solid hashing. 
Sounds delicious. It's not, it's a, uh, well, it just, the, ki the thing is we just want to make this pre-computation very, very expensive to increase the cost of trying to crack our users' passwords. So let's run a demo. So solid password, so solid hashing is um, extremely cheap. It doesn't cost you anything, but it gives you a lot of protection. As you can see, it kind of returned immediately. And all we have to do is we have to generate a salt when we sign up the user. In this case, I've chosen to generate 64 cryptographically secure random bytes. It's very easy. Just say 64 and you get them. And then all you have to do when you hash, hash the password is that you have to put in the salt first, then you put in a delimiter, and then you put the password. That means that even if people use the same password, they're going to have unique salts, and that way they'll get a unique hash. The issue is then you have to save the salt with the password and all that. Um, not too much of a hassle. Um, another important point is that the salt um, doesn't have to be secret. It's just um, there to uh, hinder the attacker from having these pre-computed rainbow tables. Um, and then what you have to do when you log in is that, again, you have to read out the salt from the database and you have to uh, go through the same thing again. Um, so a very easy way to um, to to get a extra to get a fair bit of security. This is the digest of it. Um, the issue is always how many bytes do you need to uh, to generate, like how many bytes needs to be in your salt, and that depends on the hashing algorithm that you're using. So uh, before, when we just had hashing, our password database looked like this. So you have dog and dog ninety nine three. Um, they both have the same password, but suddenly you have a salt in there, and now they all have unique passwords. So pretty nice. Um, problem though, it's too efficient. You saw how fast I could um, run the um, the hashing function or the uh, the small script on my computer. So if you just uh, time this, and this is including the startup time of, of getting Node up and running and, and registering the user first, and you see that it's done in like 114 milliseconds. So very, very fast, which might seem nice. I mean, then you can log in users very, very quickly. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but um, but the problem is that uh, if you have an attacker, even though they have to do the whole uh, cracking for every single user using the unique salt, um, it's still very 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 easy to uh, to just get a big CPU with a lot of cores and just crank away at this. So if you get a if a, if you get a, like one of the bigger machines on Amazon with uh, 64 cores, you can probably do a couple of trillion of these hashes a second. So it's very fast. Uh, to just uh, crack passwords. Um, and we have known this since like um, the early 2000s that you shouldn't use the um, cryptographic, uh, the cryptographic hash function. You should, uh, you should use a password-based hash function. Um, that doesn't stop these guys from doing this. So these guys, even though it's been known since like the early 2000s that you should do this, they still did this uh, only a couple of years ago. Though I want to say in um, in Dropbox defense, they they did know this. They did realize that they were doing something that wasn't too clever, and they were trying when the when that database was uh, leaked, they were trying to migrate users to a stronger algorithm called Bcrypt, which I'll talk about in a second. So it's not all bad. They are trying to um, the like big companies are trying to to protect protect their users. So what can we do about this? just burn our money, throw away more money. We can use these functions that are much more expensive to run because when uh, you are up against an adversary, it is a arms race. It is how fast can he crack your passwords and the objective for you is to make it as expensive as possible for him to crack your password, for him or her to crack your passwords. Um, and there's going to be some um, limit when it's no longer feasible, economically feasible for the attacker to crack passwords and he will instead go and find something else to do. So what can we do? We can do something called iterated hashing. And that's what people kind of um, have known all along. But it started to go into uh, production in the early 2000s. And now we're actually getting to somewhere where this is something you can do today. It's not what I recommend you, can, you do, but you can do it. And it's 
regarded as safe. Um, so iterated hashing, specifically the hash function that's also in node call called PBKDF2, stands, stands for password-based key duration function 2, is NIST compliant. So NIST is the uh, National Institute for Standards and Technology, the US body that governs what can US businesses and uh, government agencies do and not do when it comes to handling um, um, citizens' data. So show the example. Whoops. So iterate password hashing, now it starts to get a bit complicated. So if you run this, um, okay, just a second, I'll just explain what's going on here. So what you do with iterated hashing is that um, you have to choose a number of iterations. So the idea is that you uh, take the user's password, you hash it, then you take the hash, feed it back into the hash algorithm, and you do that over and over again. And if you do that like a million times, then there's no shortcut for an attacker or an adversary. The adversary will have to do the exactly the same thing for every single possible every possible password that they want to try out. They have to feed it through the hash algorithm over and over and over again. And um, the idea is there's no shortcut. There's no way to reduce the amount of rounds. So you choose a number of iterations. Um, then you have to choose how many bits do you want out of the hash. And you have to choose what hashing algorithm do you want to use. And then you also have to supply a salt and um, you can see suddenly the line is very, very long and there's a lot of stuff for you to take care of. And also you have to persist all this to your database. And in the future, if you want to migrate to another algorithm or you want to up the parameters or something, you have to take care of all that too. So a lot of moving parts, but it does mean that, um, let's just set this down a little bit. So now we have 10,000 rounds. Oh, whoops, what happened there? Terminate. So if we run this, now we have 10,000 rounds. And you can see it suddenly takes a bit more time. So if we time this, instead of only taking 114 milliseconds, now it takes 450 milliseconds, including the uh, the whole startup time uh, for Node to get started. And um, you can always adjust these rounds so you can figure out, okay, what's the acceptable limit for your users when they want to log into your service? It's probably something like uh, a couple of hundred milliseconds because if it takes a couple of hundred milliseconds to try each version of the password, then suddenly it's getting very, very expensive for an attacker to try and crack passwords. Um, so this was essentially what's going on. You had the iterated hash, you take in the plain text, you have your hash function, which takes a bunch of parameters. You, um, you hash the plain text and you get the first digest. And then you say for every single iteration that we've, um, we put in as a parameter, we take the old digest, hash it, and make it the new digest, and we do this over and over and over again, and in the end we just return the digest, which is basically what's going on. There's a bit more to it with the uh, PBKDF2, um, something about HMAX and that kind of stuff, but yeah, this is what's happening behind the scenes. And this is the digest of, of how do you do this in Node. So, very nice. And this is um, this is something you can use if you're using this in your company, it's, it's perfectly all right, but you can do a lot better. Um, so the problem is that it's very, very easy to paralyze, <coughs> paralyze this. Why is it easy to paralyze? That's because it's still using a, um, a hash function that has a very, very low memory footprint. So this takes a lot of CPU power, but it takes very, very little memory. And um, today, uh, in like around uh, 2012, 13, you started to be able to program um, graphic cards and graphic cards are very exciting because graphic cards have thousands of cores. They have very low memory bandwidth because they don't, they don't read to need to read uh, a couple of pixels at a time. But it means that you suddenly you have thousands of cores at your disposal. And if this hash algorithm doesn't require a lot of memory, then you can just parallelize it across a couple of graphic cards. So top of the line graphic card on Amazon as of current is the, uh, it's called, I think it's called the G8 machine. It has eight of the NVIDIA Titan, the top of the line graphics card. And I think it has something like, uh, is it a couple of hundred thousand cores or something like that, like an insane amount. So it means if you want to crack uh, PBKDF2 uh, passwords, you can probably do a couple of million attempts a second. And uh, renting this machine only costs around a euro an hour. So if you have 200 euros to spare, then you can rent out 200 of these machines for an hour. And that means that you can do a couple of trillion uh, cracking attempts, which means you can do uh, you can get a fair way on a standard database. So uh, this is what 
um, happen to Dropbox. So this is what the bcrypt algorithm does. The bcrypt algorithm I mentioned earlier, it's not built into node core, but uh, you can get there's like bindings for it out there. Um, and uh, the bcrypt uses something called Blowfish, which is a, a cryptographic block cipher, and it's essentially what it does. It's the same thing here. It iterates over the hash value um, a couple of like a bunch of times, makes it very hard to to um, to crack the passwords, but still it's very very easy to put in parallel on, for example, a graphics card. So what can we do? Burn more money, and that's kind of what I was hinting at because um, these memory cards or these graphics cards. They have very low uh, memory bandwidth, so it's very, very hard to, cons if you consume a lot of memory, suddenly it's troublesome to try and crack passwords in parallel. So now we're getting up to modern standards. Now we're getting up to modern key derivation functions, and it, they're called so because they take in a, a weak password. So human passwords are, are pretty weak in uh, computer terms. But you can take a weak password and you can do something called key stretching and entropy extraction and all sorts of crypto stuff and suddenly you can get a much stronger key out of it so you could use it to encrypt um, uh, disk drives and that kind of stuff. But we can also use it for passwords. So they're designed to be slow, they're designed to be consume a lot of memory and a lot of computation so it's very very hard to calculate the value but that's what we want. So the state of the art, state of the art is this function called argon2. So in 2013, there have been a lot of leaks and um, the cryptographic community started to kind of realize that we need to do something about this. And that's kind of how the crypto community works. They realize there's some new cipher, a new, new building block in, in our infrastructure we need. So we're gonna put out a competition and we're gonna battle everyone against each other. So you propose a new algorithm and then everyone else is allowed to attack your algorithm and you do these rounds and and the password hashing competition, which um, started in 2013, I think, they ended up uh, recommending this function called argon2. So let's try and run the argon2 function. So let's see, I have it here. So this is what it looks like. Um, it's not a node call. Um, me and my friend Matthias have made this module called Sodium Native. Sodium is a um, alternative crypto library has some other uh, primitives in there and it has this function called crypto pv hash string which uh, takes in a hash or um, oh that's actually a mistake no it's, it takes in the hash so you have to allocate some memory externally like there's some funny stuff here you, ha you have to take in the hash so that it writes the return value to at some point takes in your password and then you only have two parameters to worry about one is how many operations do you want to do so how much cpu power can you spend and then the next one is how much memory can you spend and uh, it's pretty easy to use, um, except that it has that weird thing about you need to pass in a buffer that it can write to and stuff like that. But um, so if we try and run this, you can see again now it's it's very very slow. But um, how I mean how is this different from the the PBKDF2? So we can have a look at that. So I'll put up these uh, test benches. We're going to use a uh, Unix command called top top is used to monitor what a process is doing and how many resources it's spending. So um, first I'm going to go back and fix this because I put it down the iteration count so we could see what was going on. So now I'm going to put up the iteration count so we have a chance to actually look what the process is doing. Now I'll start the node process. Now I'll start top and you can see here that uh, the pbkdf2 function, it's packing my CPU, it's spending all the power that it has. Whoop, it disappeared suddenly. So we need to spend some more energy. Oh, wait a second, it was because I was in the wrong. Here we go. So it's pegging my CPU, but it's only using nine megabytes of memory, and that's including the memory that uh, the node process is using. So, uh, I mean, this computer has, um, or the, the graphics card on the in, in, um, NVIDIA Titan has 12 gigabytes of memory. So I don't know what uh, 12 gigabytes divided by nine megabytes is, but it's a hell of a lot. I mean, you can run a lot of these processes in parallel. But if we go and, um, let's just stop this. If we go and uh, we run my argon2 function instead, you can see that it's it's pegging my CPU again, but it's using 500 megabytes of memory. So it's suddenly stealing a lot of memory. And it's pretty easy to do the math because uh, 12 gigabytes divided by 500 megabytes, that's only, 12 this, that's only 24 processes in parallel. So suddenly it's very, very, very expensive to crack passwords and an adversary is probably gonna do something else with their time and their money. So, this is what it looks like. There's a bit of stuff going on here and it's a bit uh, complicated and all that. 
So uh, another problem is that this is blocking. So if any of you have done any Node.js, we don't want blocking stuff. Node.js is single threaded, meaning that if we uh, kick off a password hashing and it takes a couple of seconds, if you have 10 users trying to log in at the same time, you can do one at a time, and the nine other users have to wait for this one guy to finish up, then the next one, then the next one, and it's going to take a long time, a lot of time, and people are going to get angry, and you're going to lose all your users. So um, it's pretty simple to solve. Oh, it sounds simple to solve. It's it's kind of hard in reality, but we can try and make stuff async. And um, so it's kind of complicated. So I've done it for you. It's very, very easy. Now you can uh, securely manage passwords. You just have to npm install secure password. It uses uh, the argon2 function. Uh, secure password also does a couple of other things for you, like it cho chooses the parameters, so you don't have to worry about what are secure parameters that are still efficient, so people don't have to wait too long. And um, it also has this nice property that um, you only need to do three lines of code, and then you can log people in. You can also uh, adjust the algorithm in the future. So if you find out in, in five years that Argon2 probably wasn't that good an idea, that's like something called maybe a reduction attack, I can just swap out the algorithm underneath, or we can swap the algorithm out underneath, and you can still log in your old users, but upgrade them as they try again. So um, that's very nice. And also, um, I mean, it's very, very easy to, uh, to set up. So let's, uh, let's have a look at the actual example. So this is what secure password looks like. And now we're suddenly back to what looks a lot like the model we started out with. So when we register, um, I've, tried, I've, I've removed all the callbacks here. So this is actually blogging. But I mean, it's just one line to do the, uh, the password hashing. Save that to the database. And then it's just one line to check if the password is actually the one we saved to the database and it um, doesn't get much simpler than that. And um, this file uses the uh, default parameters. So you can see it's pretty fast, uh, but still it uh, consumes, um, I think the default is uh, 32 megabytes of memory per user. And it uh, spent has to go over three these uh, 32 megabytes of memory a couple of times. So it's still slow enough that it's, um, it's kind of expensive if you want to crack people's passwords. You probably only want to do this if for example, you found the president's uh, Twitter account and you want to crack the password, so you can do go do a couple of silly tweets, uh, but it's uh, prohibitive enough that you don't want to do it just uh, for everyone. So um, that's pretty much it. But I just want to dwell a bit by why did I use the Sodium native? Why did I go with the building crypto module? And this is something specific to Node, but it kind of kind of translates to a lot of languages. So. In cryptography, uh, OpenSSL has been the uh, de facto crypto library for a lot of years. Um, and OpenSSL implements a lot of these NIST standards um, with TLS and SSL and all that. Uh, but there's kind of an alternative truth to all this. Not like the American alternative truth, but like an alternative that's more efficient and makes it more secure and easier for people to use. And that's this library called Libsodium. It's a C library, but uh, Sodium native, which you can install in NPM, is a uh, JavaScript binding, so you can easily do a lot of cryptography very easily um, without having to worry too much about all these algorithm and algorithms and what are the secure um, parameters to use and all that. Um, and um, you just uh, install like this, and then you can do your own password hashing, or you can encrypt uh, files, or you can do key exchange, and you can do a lot of fancy stuff uh, that's very, very cool. And, and um, it also takes the cryptography to a level where it starts to be engineering instead of mathematics again. So that means that you can build your own cryptographic applications um, in a secure way. And the newest project that we're working on is something called Sodium Universal. So the problem is that um, Sodium Native is a, is a native add-on, so you can only run it on the server. But a lot of times you also want to do this in the browser, and this is where it gets very, very exciting. So uh, Sodium Universal is uh, JavaScript ports of all the uh, cryptographic algorithms inside Sodium. And that means that you can start to do cryptography in the browser and um, do something like a client-side password database, or um, you can send encrypted files between users without you as a server having to touch it. Because people's information is like uh, toxic waste. You want to have as little of it as possible. So um, now you go home and uh, you start using secure password, or at least study the source code, <laughs> and uh, you can port it to whatever language you're using in your company. So thank you. <laughs>